Good morning. Good to see everybody here again. Uh, today we're going to be in Acts chapter 17 as we've been going through uh, the New Testament and also through the book of Acts. And we find ourselves in what's commonly called Paul's second missionary journey. So now Paul is traveling with Silas. We also saw that uh, they had picked up a couple other companions at least with Luke and Timothy. And they're traveling about various cities. They now find themselves in Macedonia, a brand new place to share the gospel. And they're going about and sharing the gospel. Well, as we get into chapter 17, they're leaving the city of Philippi. And they're going to travel east. And we'll find them eventually getting to Thessalonica. And it seems to be that Luke and Timothy stay behind. Because we're going to see the pronouns shift. If you remember, in chapter 16, we took note of the fact that the pronouns had kind of shifted to Luke using we and us, and including himself in the company of Paul. But now in chapter 17, uh, he's going to be speaking more in the third person again, indicating that Luke perhaps was left behind. Uh, Timothy as well. And so just because the story is going to now shift to Thessalonica, we should never uh, think that the work ended in Philippi. As a matter of fact, by the time the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Philippi, they already have deacons and elders. In uh, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1, we see that they're a well-established church. I can't help but think that a lot of that has to do with the work that Timothy uh, and Luke did there at Philippi. And so, this is a pretty interesting uh, you know, way to do it. Paul's plunging ahead, Paul and Cyrus are plunging into new territory, but Luke and uh, Timothy staying behind and, and further establishing those churches that Paul and uh, Silas are leaving to break new ground. And we'll see that happen here in chapter 17. But it begins in verse 1, it says, Now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Now all of these different towns were connected by the same road. Uh, so they're, they're basically going down the um, Macedonian highway, and they're passing these various towns. Now, it could be because uh, Amphibolus and Apollonia were smaller communities that they wanted to hit the, the big city, and hit the big city first, and then with the hopes that the gospel would then spread to these smaller communities. Or it could be that these two cities didn't have a synagogue, which, uh, as we all know by this point, Paul loved to engage in a city or a town first through its synagogue and proclaim the gospel. We'll see him do that here in Thessalonica. But for whatever reason, he passes through these first two cities and lands in Thessalonica, which was a very influential city there in Macedonia. As a matter of fact, it's seen as the capital of uh, Macedonia, especially eastern Macedonia there. Had over 200,000 citizens, so a very large city, the largest city there in Macedonia, <coughs> Uh, and apparently a very large synagogue, which is different than the other uh, towns and cities that they've been to. If you remember in Philippi, all they could really find is just a small group of women praying by the river. No real well-established synagogue there. But here, not so. There's a pretty big Jewish population here at Thessalonica. And they seem to be enjoying some freedoms there, even though Thessalonica was more of a Roman-type uh, city. But they find themselves there in Thessalonica... And uh, he says that he goes there where a synagogue, of, there, there was a synagogue of the Jews in verse 12, I'm sorry, verse 2. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. So, as was his custom, and of course the reader of the book of Acts already can gather that this was his custom. Because we see him doing this over and over and over again, going straight to the synagogues. Which, I think is a pretty good, well for one, Paul would do this theologically, and scripturally, because in Paul's mind, he felt as though because the Jews were the children of the promise, because they were uh, the children of the covenants made to Abraham, the Apostle Paul believed that the Jews had the right to hear the gospel first. Um, in Romans 1.16, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone, from the Jew first, also to the Greek. I and mean, Paul felt like his fellow countrymen should have the opportunity to receive the gospel first, before taking it to the Gentiles. But you can also see it as a strategic way of doing it as well. 
Think about it. If you're traveling and you're wanting to spread the gospel as quickly as you can and to get to many cities as you can, it just makes sense that you would go to people that already have kind of a background, a scripture, a background in the scriptures, already are familiar with the God that you're speaking about, already is familiar with the texts that were accepted as messianic, who already had an idea of things to where you could kind of hit the ground running, sharing the gospel with them. And once you have that core group established, then you can begin to spread out to others who may not be as well versed and as well knowledgeable about the things that you're speaking about. And this is a good strategy for us to follow in our own uh, lives. Um, you know, when at work, I've, I've had several uh, Bible studies at work, and one of the things that I would do, and I, I wasn't conscientiously doing this because Paul did it, but uh, just naturally, when I wanted to have a Bible study with my coworkers, I would first gather those who I knew would enjoy a Bible study. I'd get with those who I knew had a, a God consciousness of people who I knew saw God's Word as the Word of God, gather them together first, get a core group, and then begin to spread out and begin to invite other people there. But as long as you have that established group, then you can have some consistency and then share further. And that's a good practice to have in general. Where you're thinking about coworkers, or you're thinking about your family, or you're thinking about some other organization that you want to, you know, share the gospel with. Find those who are, would be the most receptive. Find them first, share the gospel, get a core group, and then you can find that you have more hands at work to spread it further to those who perhaps don't have the knowledge or the background, scriptural background that perhaps others do. Um, it's, a, it's a great uh, strategy, uh, but here again, the Apostle Paul is probably doing it more so from a theological background, but still, uh, it seems to be very effective. Uh, but anyways, it says, he did as was his custom these three Sabbaths. Now some suggest that perhaps Paul and Silas were only at Thessalonica for three weeks because of this text. And so a person who's reading 1 Thessalonians can become a little bit perplexed by that because he's speaking to a people that he seems to have really spent a lot of time with. And uh, the way that he describes his ministry there, and we'll look at it more here in a moment, seems to have been protracted over a fairly lengthy amount of time. Not, it doesn't have to be a long, not as long as he was in uh, Ephesus or in Corinth, but at least several months. All Luke here is saying is that this was his initial push into Thessalonica, that for three Sabbaths, he was intent on going to the synagogue, proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah. It might be after these three weeks, he was no longer permitted into the synagogue. Uh, and then began to meet in Jason's house. But he's just given the initial push that Paul and Silas uh, gave here in Thessalonica. But they do this for three weeks. And in verse 3 it says, Explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. And saying, This Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. All right, so this is a very important message, and it's a common message that he would have shared as he was going to various synagogues in various cities, and that is that it was necessary that he had to suffer and rise again from the dead. Based on the Old Testament scriptures, these two things had to take place. You know, in the Jewish minds back then, they had basically, they had a very hard time rectifying and bringing cohesion to the thought that the Messiah was going to be one who was suffering, as Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 seem to describe. Uh, he was going to be someone who was going to bear the, the, their sorrows. He was going to be beaten. He was going to be pierced with, in his hands and his feet. He was going to be a suffering Messiah. But then also with a Psalm 2 Messiah that's going to be reigning as king, and you need to kiss the sun while you have a chance because he's... You know, he's ruling with a rod of iron and things like that. The Jewish people in the first century had a really hard time bringing those two ideas together. How can the Messiah be this defeated, uh, suffering servant as presented in Isaiah 53, but at the same time be reigning as a king according to David uh, and in line with what David did? And so they had, the way that they dealt with this, they said, well, there must be two Messiahs. There was... You know, Messiah bar David, who was going to be the reigning king, the one who was going to come in and really take over the nations, 
bring Israel back together in one unit again and, and rule over all the nations. But then there was uh, the Messiah Bar Joseph, who was going to be the one like Joseph in the book of Genesis, that was going to be rejected by his brothers, was going to be suffering, was going to go through hardships. And so they dealt with this by having two messiahs, basically, looking forward to two messiahs. But Paul, when he came to the synagogues, he said, no, there's one messiah, one Christ, and he fulfills both of these roles. It was necessary that he fulfills both of those roles because both of those roles are scriptural and both of those roles are definitely founded in the Old Testament scriptures. Yes, the Messiah was going to suffer, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, and other places. Yes, the Messiah is also going to reign and rule over the nations and, and uh, bring in a kingdom, usher in a kingdom. But it was going to be done by this one individual who would, yes, suffer a horrific death on the cross, but at the same time rise again. Because you can't have a dead king reigning. So it was necessary that he would have to rise again. That's also implied in Isaiah 52 and other places. That he would rise again and then also that he would be reigning. So Paul would say, Jesus Christ is the Messiah who fulfills all of the scriptures and all the, the testimonies about the Messiah in himself by dying on the cross and being risen again. And so he's explaining this from uh, the scriptures. And it says, uh, it goes on in verse 4, And some of them were persuaded, and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks, and a number of the leading women. All right, so some of them were persuaded. He goes to the synagogue, some of them say, yeah, okay, we can see what you're talking about, Paul. And they accepted it. And then also some of the God-fearing Greeks who were, we've talked about before, these were people who feared the God of the Jews, but didn't follow in the customs of the Jews. They weren't circumcised. They didn't follow the law of Moses. They just recognized and feared uh, the God of the Jews. They are also accepting what Paul and Silas are teaching. And so Luke gives us a very uh, bare bones account of what happens here in Thessalonica. But if we turn to 1 Thessalonians, we'll find that the Apostle Paul gives us a lot more information and brings a lot more color to uh, what takes place there in Acts chapter 17 in Thessalonica. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we can see how, why Paul was so successful in proclaiming the gospel to the people at Thessalonica. There, he's starting in verse 1. Again, this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. He says, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. Even though we're going to see that they were pushed out fairly quickly out of Thessalonica, he's saying our work was not vain. And he gives some reasons why their work there was not in vain. In verse 2, But after we had already suffered and been mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. So one thing that they did that caused them to be successful at Thessalonica was they spoke boldly in opposition. And, and there could have been overlap. You know, we're going to get into in a moment where they're going to really seek opposition. But, you know, we, it doesn't take too much of the imagination to recognize that while in those three Sabbaths, as they were proclaiming, there was probably opposition already. People saying, that, Paul, you don't know what you're talking about. No, it doesn't say that. Uh, a lot of opposition. But they were still speaking boldly about the things of Christ, even amid this opposition that was beginning to arise. But they also had pure speech. Uh, continuing in verse 3, it says, For our exhortation does not come from error of impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, uh, who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority. So they had purity of speech, or we could even say purity of intentions, which led to their purity of speech. Uh, they were speaking from pure motives. Uh, Paul and Silas didn't get up and come up with this elaborate <coughs> scheme and this uh, elaborate story that would coerce the people to believe in the Messiah, but doing it with selfish ambition or, or doing it in a manipulative way or through coercion. 
They just spoke the truth. They spoke it in its purity, in its pure form. And so because they were speaking from a pure heart, from pure motives, with pure speech, that led to their work not being in vain. But they also had gentle conduct. In verse 7, But we prove to be gentle among you, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. They were very gentle among them. Which doesn't really give us a picture of what we typically think of Paul. Right? As you're reading the book of Acts, or maybe you read especially the book of Galatians, I think sometimes we formulate in our minds that the Apostle Paul was this aggressive, abrasive person that just told it like it was, this John Wayne of the gospel who just, you know, just blurted out whatever he wanted to say, didn't care what people felt or anything like that. And he was just this um, austere individual who just was just uh, right in your face all the time. But that's not how Paul describes his ministry at all. When he speaks about his ministry among the churches, and we see it here in Second uh, First Thessalonians chapter two, he said we were gentle among you, like a like a mother nurturing her children. You can't get much more gentler than that. And that was the conduct that they had among them. The Apostle Paul exemplified that. He also taught it in Second Timothy chapter two, where he instructed Timothy to kind of follow his example there. In verse 24, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. I think sometimes we think, well, in order to be bold, I've got to be aggressive, and I've got to be abrasive, and I've got to you know, just plow over people with the gospel and hit them over the head with the Bible. And if I'm doing that, and I'm being bold, and I'm standing up for the truth, and you know, I'm being a great patriot of, of Christ or something like that. To do that is to completely miss the mark from what the Apostle Paul did. With gentleness, as a nurturing mother, he'll go on to describe himself as a father uh, caring for them. But he was a very gentle type of individual who cared for people, and it showed in the way that he spoke to them. You can be bold and gentle at the same time. Boldness just means you don't back down. Boldness just means that you say it like you believe it, you live it like you believe it, and you're just uh, forthcoming with what you believe. But you can do that in a gentle and kind way without, again, plowing over everybody in the process. We should always be gentle and kind in the way that we share the gospel, in the way that we share the gospel with people. But uh, going back to First Thessalonians, there's more of a description here. As he uh, begins to talk about the love that he had. And it kind of connects to that idea of gentleness. In verse 8 of First Thessalonians 2, Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you have become very dear to us. Their motivation was love. That was their motivating factor. Uh, he'll say here in a moment that he didn't do it to become rich or to become a, a televangelist or anything like that, or, you know, to amass this great wealth or to get this prestigious name uh, there in the world. But he did it because he loved them. He had a great fond affection for them. And if we have any motivation other than that, we're either not going to be motivated at all, or when we do engage in sharing the gospel, we're not going to do it in a proper way. We might even do more damage than we would have had we just not said anything. If you're motivated by love, you're more likely to be motivated at all. In other words, if, if all we're motivated by is, well, the Bible says I should share the gospel, so let me share the gospel. In all likelihood, what we're going to do is we're going to probably do just enough to kind of uh, be able to say at the end of the day that we shared the gospel. We're going to do just enough to uh, kind of ease our conscience or our mind that we fulfilled the scriptures but if we're motivated by love, I look at this individual and I see a, a, a soul, a human being, a living being who's made in the image of God, a person whom God loves so much that he sent his own son to die for that individual, an individual who could potentially end up in a eternal punishment and damnation. And I look at that individual and say, I don't want them to go that path. I love that individual. I want them to have the blessed peace that I have through Jesus Christ. I want them to have the eternal life that I have through Jesus Christ. 
I want that individual to be blessed just as I have been blessed through Jesus Christ. And we look at that individual out of love and compassion and care. We're going to be a lot more motivated to not just check off the list that we shared the gospel with them. But we really desperately want them to come to believe in Jesus Christ out of love and care and compassion and out of affection for them. If we're motivated by love, if we look at, if we're walking through the grocery store, we're walking down the road, or we're in our workplace, and we're looking at people out of love and care for their soul, don't you think we'll be motivated to share the gospel with them? We won't have to be coerced, or we won't need a scripture, you know, knocked against our head or something like that. We want to share the gospel with them because we love them and we care for them. We want them to come to a loving faith in Jesus Christ. And then they had, they practiced what they preached, uh, continuing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave towards you believers, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and employing each of you as a father would his own children, so that you would... Walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. They practice what they preach too. Now had they, had they uh, just been speaking boldly in opposition, had they just been uh, speaking pure words, had they just been uh, being gentle among them and then being motivated by love, but then had a, a lifestyle that was completely contrary to everything that they were teaching, do you think they would have been very effective in, in their ministry in Thessalonica? Not at all. One of the things that brought power to what they were saying was the lifestyle that backed up the words that they were speaking. The Thessalonians could look at Paul and say, that's the man that cared for me. That's the man who is not, obviously not selfishly motivated. He's going above and beyond to show that he's not selfishly motivated. He's got a holy and blameless lifestyle that I would like to even emulate in my own life. This man is true. And this man is right. You could say the same thing for Silas. But uh, because they were practicing what they preached, it gave more weight to what they were preaching. And it helped them to be more effective in their, in their teaching. And so as we, as we think about, you know, this approach that they had, as we get kind of the filling in the blanks of what we just get the bare bones of in Acts chapter 17, we can ask ourselves uh, this question, you know, is this the type of approach that I have in sharing the gospel? We have to be humble and really think about that. Because sometimes we might be going about it the wrong way, and all the while be thinking, well, clearly that individual doesn't care about God, or clearly that individual doesn't care what the Bible says. And we see the fault, we always put the fault in the individual that's not receiving the message. But we got to examine ourselves. Am I speaking boldly in opposition or, or do I simply just, you know, wilt under the, the pressure, the heat of the circumstances and, and kind of just uh, wilt away whenever opposition comes up? Um, am I speaking from pure motives or am I just trying to sell something to them? And, and is that being impressed upon the person that I'm not really caring about them? I'm just coming up with this, uh, you know, this, this sell, uh, the sales point of trying to sell them the gospel or sell them my church or something like that. Uh, does the person, am I being too ag aggressive or abrasive in the way that I'm speaking? Am I being condescending? Am I looking down on the individual as though they're lesser of a human being because they don't have the truth that I have? Am I motivated by something besides love? Am I just doing it just to check off the list that I've shared the gospel with this many people this week? Or do I really care for them and have concern for them? And does that show in the way that I'm speaking and the way that I'm relating to them? What about my lifestyle? Is my lifestyle consistent with what I'm speaking? When I'm speaking with my coworkers, you know, am I, am I speaking one thing, but then when something happens, at the job site, I act a totally different way. First examine ourselves. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to accept the gospel. Uh, the gospel. Sharing the gospel is the one thing that you just don't ultimately have control over. You know, if you're doing a computer program, 
typically speaking, not all the time, but typically speaking, what you, the input that you put into the computer is the output. Uh, what you put into the program is what you get out of the program. Uh, you just push this, this, these keys, you put in this particular formula or whatever, and this is what comes out. We're sharing the gospel, it's not like that. You may do everything perfect, you might do everything right, and still not get the results that you wanted. But at the end of the day, you can say, hey, it wasn't me. At the end of the day, you can say, I had the right approach, I had the right motives, and therefore then, perhaps it is on that individual who may have a closed heart to the gospel. But first thing we got to check is ourselves and not make assumptions about the other person. So they had the right, the right approach. They were doing everything right. This led to them having a successful ministry, even though Thessalonica seems to be a very hard place to, to uh, engage with uh, and to, uh, to infiltrate uh, if you're trying to share the gospel. But we also have to give some credit to those at Thessalonica who received the gospel. Right? So we don't want to give all the credit to Paul and Silas. They definitely receive a lot of the, the credit. But as we've mentioned before, even though you do everything right, still a person has to come to a point where they say, yes, I accept this, and yes, I will allow this to affect my life. And those at Thessalonica did that. In 1 Thessalonians, again, we get more color, more information about what went on there. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, in verse 13, it says, For this reason we also constantly thank God, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. They received the message, not just as, oh yeah, Paul, uh, Silas, um, you make good arguments and everything, we accept it, and we just go on. Our, our way as though they just had some great philosophical ideas that they could um, just give mental assent to and then go on. But they received it as the word of God. And that brought weight to what they were hearing and it also performed a work in them and changed their lives and brought transformation. It's totally different receiving a message and receiving it just as the word of man and receiving it as the word of God. Uh, when, we, when we're sharing the word of God here, you know, Hopefully what's being shared is not just the word of man, but the word of God. And how you, how you assimilate that and think about that and how you take that in affects how that's going to work out in your life. It's not just good ideas. It's not just historical facts. It's not just this, that, or the other. It's the word of God. And this should have weight in my life. This should actually change the way that I live, the way that I relate to other people, the things that I do. And not only did they receive it well, but they did it even in the midst of persecution. Going back to chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians, um, starting in verse 6, it says, You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation, with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you may become an example to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. Uh, and he goes on and elaborates more on that. But they received the gospel and they did it in much persecution, but also in the joy of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the weight of the persecution could do nothing to outweigh the joy that they had in the Holy Spirit. The joy of the fact that my sins are forgiven. The joy of knowing that God's presence is with me. God's strength is with me. God's comfort is with me. God himself is with me everywhere that I go. That far outweighed the hardships and trials that were coming at them from the Jewish community there at Thessalonica. And so here we can see a beautiful exchange. Proclaimers of the gospel, proper proclaimers of the message of, of Jesus Christ, who are doing it from a good motivation, good ways, but it also being received with a good heart. Um, great example for us to emulate. And so we got to ask ourselves, you know, am I, a, am I a proper proclaimer of the message of God? When I'm hitting the streets, when I'm hitting my job site, when I'm going out to my families, am I proclaiming it properly? But then also when I have my Bible open and when I'm listening to God's word being presented, am I a proper receiver of the word? 
Do I receive it as the Word of God? Do I allow it to transform my life? Do I receive it with joy and happiness, even though it might cause some hardship in my life? Um, where, wh whichever way you're looking at it, whether you're the proclaimer or the receiver, we get a good example from these people at Thessalonica and from Paul and Silas as well. So now going back to Acts chapter 17, we'll see the results of this. In verse 5, it says, But the Jews becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. Uh, when they did, uh, in verse 6, when they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also, and Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And they stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. Great opposition. Again, probably already received some opposition, more verbal opposition as they were proclaiming the gospel in the synagogue <coughs> those three Sabbaths. But now it's really getting rich. Now it's really getting, uh, it's really heating up here. <coughs> and it says that they were becoming jealous. You know, that's the same motivation that the people had for offering up Jesus. If you remember, Pilate recognized that. He said it's because of envy they had brought him, and that's why he wanted him to be released. He knew that Jesus hadn't done anything wrong. It was just because they were envious of him. Same thing is happening here. They're being jealous. The Jews, the leading Jews, are jealous of the fact that Paul and Silas are beginning to have this following. And uh, they, they're intimidated by that. And it says that they, they took some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob, and set the city in an uproar. The irony here is that in a moment they're going to say that Paul and Silas are the one that's upsetting the world, but look what they're doing in their own city. They're causing this big uh, uproar and, and causing all this drama. Um, and then they attacked the house of Jason. Now, Jason, the house of Jason might have been attacked because Jason was uh, showing hospitality to Paul and Silas. Maybe Paul and Silas were staying at his home. Uh, that would be consistent with what they, what they said, that Jason had welcomed them. Um, in verse 7, he received them into his home. Or it could be that he, that he had a house church at his, at his home. That was definitely common. We see that in the book of Acts, uh, people meeting in homes, sharing a meal, sharing the, the Lord's Supper and things like that. Um, it could be that their house, or it could have been both, that, they had Paul and Silas, that he had Paul and Silas in his home and he had a house church. For whatever reason, Jason is the one who's being attacked here, which is, which is interesting. But listen to what they say. This is the accusation. These men who have upset the world have come here also. I think the King James says they've turned the world upside down. And uh, I, I read one uh, commentator who said, you know, the world was already turned upside down because of what happened in the garden. Man sinned against God. And because of sin, the world was already upside down. Paul and Silas were just turning the world right side up again. Uh, by proclaiming the gospel, bringing things back to right, back in alignment with God as it should have been uh, originally. But nonetheless, they're saying that these men are upsetting the world. Uh, the world sometimes just represented the Roman Empire in that, in that day and age, or it could be speaking about uh, the whole earth. Uh, but nonetheless, they're saying that they're upsetting the world. And I would suggest that that is a true indicator of whether we're truly following the Lord. We ought to be upsetters of the world. The world has a particular worldview. They have a particular way of looking at life. Uh, they have a way of approaching life, whether it be according to money and wealth or pleasure or prestige or self, uh, self-interest or, or whatever it might be. But we as believers, we ought to be a, Stirring up the waters in the sense that not in an ugly way or in a bad way, but just through living a holy and righteous life, but also speaking those pure words of life, having an impact on the world around us. Um, it's kind of like when you strike the water, you know, or you hit the water and the ripple effect takes place. That's what we ought to be doing. When we were, when we accepted the gospel, God did so to 
throw us out into the world to cause ripples, to go out there and, and make an effect and make an impact on the world around us. We ought to be upsetting the world in a positive way, in a way that uh, glorifies and honors our Father in heaven. But that's what they're being accused of. And certainly they're not trying to, they're, they're not politically motivated here. They're not trying to do it in the way that they're being accused here. Uh, but they were upsetting the world in the sense that they were proclaiming a gospel that's countercultural. Cultural it was back then, and it is today. And then notice, they do the same thing. The, the Jewish authorities do the same thing here at Thessalonica that they did with Jesus. It says, uh, they've upset the world, verse 7, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there's another king, Jesus. Now, did the Jews really care about Caesar? Uh, maybe some of them did. You know, you can't, you can't uh, paint with too broad of a brush, but... Um, probably those who were really zealous for their faith, really zealous for God, they resented the fact that Caesar was over them. They wanted to be an independent nation again. Uh, they weren't really loyal to Caesar in that way. But I tell you what, as soon as I need to get someone accused before the Roman court, I'm going to show as though I am concerned about Caesar and that these people are speaking out against Caesar. They did that with Jesus, said that he was proclaiming that he was a king, in opposition to Caesar. Now they're saying this uh, about Paul and Silas, who they say, yeah, they're proclaiming another king besides Caesar. They're doing that because the Roman authorities wouldn't care less if they were blaspheming. That's what they really thought about these guys. They thought they were blaspheming against God. But they knew the Romans wouldn't care whether they were blaspheming against a God that they didn't even believe in. So they come up with an accusation that they think will stick with the Roman authorities. And it says, of course, they stirred up the crowd. And the authorities uh, who heard these things, when they received a pledge from Jason and others, they released him. So Jason maybe paid some money or made a promise that, okay, we're not going to cause any problems. We're not going to stir up the community. You can trust us. And when they received that from him, they released him. Um, so what does Paul and, and Silas do? Do they pack up their bags and say, you know what? Everywhere we go, it's just hardship. Here we are trying to serve the Lord. We talked about this before. We've gone into Macedonia just as the Lord wanted us to, even though we would have preferred to go into Asia or Bithynia. And now we're following the Lord. We're, we're doing what the Lord wants us to do. And hardship after hardship, trial after trial. Let's just give up and go home. Let's pack it up. Take it home. Look at verse 10. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. They had to escape by night to get away from Thessalonica because things had heated up so much. Then they go to Berea and you think, okay, well, let's, just, let's just relax for a little bit. Let's find some repose. Let's kind of lick our wounds a little bit. No, they go right back to the activity once again. And thankfully so, because there's a great reception there. Verse 11, uh, it says, Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. For they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. More noble-minded than those at Thessalonica. Now, is it speaking about the church at Thessalonica? Like the people who received the gospel, but these guys received it in a better way? An argument might be made for that, but given what we read in 1 Thessalonians, they seem to uh, have received it in a well way. In all likelihood, what's being spoken about here is the, the general populace there at Thessalonica. Uh, who had rejected them out of envy, had persecuted them, uh, and wanted to have them convicted. Uh, but these were more noble-minded because they received the word with great eagerness. They didn't re re resist it, they didn't uh, fight against it, but they received it. And not only received it, but were eager to hear about it. And then they also examined the scriptures to see whether these things were so. They had open ears, they had an open mind, and they had an open Bible. If you have those three things, you're going to be well, more well suited to receive the truths contained in the scripture. And that's true whether you're talking about originally accepting the gospel message uh, upon conversion, or you're talking about in any biblical topic that you might come across. We need to have open ears, an open mind, and an open Bible. If you don't have open ears, you can't receive anything. If you close your ears to everything... Had they gone to Berea, and the Bereans were just like, we don't want to hear it. We know you guys are troublemakers. Just 
keep on going, Paul and Silas. Just, just keep on going. They would never receive the gospel. And if we close our ears from hearing God's word or messages from God's word, we begin to think perhaps, well, it's okay. I can figure it all out on my own. I don't need to hear anyone uh, explain the scriptures to me, or I don't need to have any resources to help me understand. I'm just going to close up my ears and just kind of plow forward and do it my all on my own. It's going to be a lot more difficult for us to to do it. We, we are a community in which we can help each other understand and to uh, further explore uh, the great revelations that God has given us through his Bible. But they also had an open mind as well. Sure, they may have shown up on the you know, on Sabbath and had their ears open and listened to everything that Paul said, but they could have closed their minds to it and say, well, that's not what I've heard, or that's not what I grew up hearing, so that's, that definitely can't be true, and just went away and didn't think about it any further. They might have had open ears, but had a closed mind that kept them from receiving what their open ears were hearing. But that wouldn't have been enough. They still needed to have an open Bible. And, and this is where they're very noble in the sense that they had an open Bible. They checked to see if those things were so. You know, if you have an open Bible, you're, you're more, it's safer for you then to have open ears and an open mind. Does that make sense? If you go in the reverse, if I know my Bible, if I have my Bible open every day and I'm reading it, I'm daily immersed in it, I'm studying it, I'm checking those cross-references, I'm, I'm going into my concordance and I'm looking up these various topics and what the Bible says about this and this place and that and this, and this other place, and I'm just saturated with God's Word and I have an open Bible, am I going to be have to be timid and not listen to what anybody says or, or, or be scared to even hear a teaching from God's Word because they might mislead me? No, because I'm already grounded in God's Word. So it happens on that end of it, but of course it helps on the other end too to say, yes, I, I'll listen to people, what people have to say, I'll have an open mind with what they're saying, but I'm going to check it all with God's Word. And that's going to be the final say. And that's where I'm going to either confirm and affirm what they're saying, or I'm going to reject what they're saying. Remember in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 it says, you know, don't you know, don't hate uh, prophetic utterances or, or, you know, don't despise prophecies, but weigh everything. Uh, receive what is good and toss out what's evil. Um, listen to what people say. Have an open ear and an open mind, but all those while weigh it against the scriptures, whether it's uh, consistent with what the scriptures reveal. In verse 12, it says, Therefore, many of them believe. Which is interesting because what Paul was saying. This, this proves that what Paul was saying, Paul was bringing converts to Christ not just because he was an eloquent speaker, which he himself didn't feel like he was an eloquent speaker as he speaks to uh, the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians. Um, it wasn't because he was persuasive or he had this flattering speech or this way of, uh, of speaking that, that convinced them. The scriptures testified to what he was saying was true. And so whether you were just listening to Paul, whether you were examining the scriptures, you would find both were consistent and, and you could believe it. Uh, the Bereans uh, had that, uh, such an experience. Uh, it says, uh, okay, therefore many of them believe, verse 12, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. But when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea also, they came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. Now those who were uh, escorted, or those who escorted Paul, brought him as far as Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they left. And that will lead us to our message next week. But once again, you know, now those from Thessalonica are chasing them down, uh, treating them like outlaws, as though they had committed some grievous crime that they needed to somehow um, enact justice for. They're chasing them down, trying to thwart what Paul and Silas are doing, trying to pull the carpet out from under the rug of their ministry. But Paul and Silas just keep on going and keep on trucking. And we'll see next week, Lord willing, that we can see Paul speaking before the Greek philosophers. Uh, so that will be an interesting study next week. So. Appreciate your kind attention this morning. And just by way of invitation, 
uh, just like to share with you that, you know, the message that God has given us is one that has been established for thousands of years in the Old Testament scriptures. The Apostle Paul was speaking from ancient texts, thousands upon thousands of years old. And he was proclaiming a word that was pertinent to them in their day and age, that was fulfilled in their day and age, and, and could be confirmed and affirmed through the things that were spoken before, giving testimony to the fact that what Jesus Christ did was according to God's plan all along. And he's died for you and me, and he's given himself for us, so that we could find salvation through, through him. And God wants you to come to him. He wants you to have a relationship with him. He even sent his own son to so that that could happen. Uh, I'd encourage you, please, if you want to receive the message, if you want to receive eternal life, to be saved from eternal condemnation and punishment, please come forward 